okay? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to get it bigger here. Okay. Um, so we're going to really talk about medicines today because I know I promised a, a super in-depth psychopharm discussion, but I, I want to really be clear that, that treatment for ADHD really does require more than just medications and, and understanding the limits of what the medicine can do and not do is really important. So once that diagnosis is really made, it's really important that a lot of effort be given to psychoeducation, that the caregivers understand the diagnosis, the teachers um, or other caregivers may need to know as well. And to address sometimes a lot of rumors or things people have seen on the internet, there's, there's a lot of not great information sometimes that people have, and they have lots of questions. So before jumping, it's really important to do that. It's also really important to, to emphasize again that these medicines are gonna target the three main symptoms of ADHD. So hyperactivity, attention and focus, and impulse control, and other challenges that may still exist after treatment, like true behavior problems, learning disorders, um, comorbid anxiety, depression, uh, given challenges, that, that's not going to necessarily respond to medicines and may require lots of other services. And on top of that, there are other services that can be really helpful for kids with ADHD. And so thinking about school treatment plans and support and and sort of modifications that can support the organization, executive functioning skills and academics can also be tremendously helpful. So I don't want to forget that part. Some kids that may struggle more with social skills aspects or needing um, organizational assistance, those may be things they need in addition to medicines. And they often can contain and acquire and have success with those things once the core ADHD symptoms are treated. But um, I will not have as much time um, to focus on these things as I, I, I would like to, but it is a really important part of treatment. Um, but that being said, we are going to go super in depth on meds today, um, but, but there's a lot more to the story I don't want to forget to help these kids and families. Um, and, and just a quick sort of resources. I think these are some of the best resources out there on ADHD, and um, specifically there are medication guideline books for parents that go into lots of what I'm going to say in detail at a, at a level families can, can really use. This first book about taking charge of ADHD not only talks about medicine, but it adds in a layer of psychoeducation to a lot of the behavior nuances and things that also help, and there's some very good organizations with accurate information um, that are great places to start, including at the very bottom, the ACAP website um, can be a tremendous help um, for families and parents that just want to read and sort of get more information. So if you have a, a caregiver that, that needs to do a little bit more time processing all this, this is a great, I actually just printed this out on a sheet of paper and handed it to them so that they had some, some, some really good evidence-based resources to, to really help them make decisions. So as we move into medicines, I think the first uh, thing to note is there is no best medication. Um, and many of the medications that we're gonna talk about, especially the stimulants, they haven't really been uh, lots of head-to-head -head efficacy discussions. And so in an ideal world, the best medication has no, no side effects and works, but it's sometimes a little bit more complicated than that. And, and remember, no medicine is going to treat 100% of all the symptoms of ADHD. So the best medicine for a person is one that has the least amount of side effects at an effective dose and improves their functionality regarding those, those symptoms. Um, as, as we talk about this, and, and we could get into the nerdiness of the etiology of biological of ADHD, but a lot of the executive, uh, executive functioning problems and then the connections from the frontal lobe to the motor cortex um, and periphery can often involve two, motor, uh, two neurotransmitters, sometimes specifically targeting frontal lobe of dopamine and norepinephrine. So most of the medicines we're going to talk about are going to affect these two systems in our bodies in, in different ways, um, but it's, it's important when we talk about um, that, that those might have some differences in both side effects and, and where they're targeting in the body. Um, we're going to talk a lot about stimulants. They do tend to be first line for ADHD, um, and a lot of that involves understanding a lot of timing issues, um, and we can get really nerdy with that. Um, and, and making decisions about long acting and short acting can have um, important differences, especially in side effect management. 
So we're going to start with talking about stimulants. Um, and there are a ton of stimulants. I have written all these names that are the brand names here, but if you will look, stimulants really are just two different types. Everything on the left-hand side is a methylphenidate product. Everything on the right-hand side is an amphetamine type product. And there really are only two types of stimulants. The reason there are so many different names and so many different types is that they're all packaged differently. So think about it being sort of the same active principle, but they're packaged differently in little packages where the wrapping paper might be different, the length of time they last might be different, um, the, the side effects might be slightly different, but they're going to really lie in these two categories. Um, and there, there are no head-to-head -head efficacy studies between these categories. They do tend to have similar efficacy in different populations, but they do have some differences in how they work. Methylphenidates, um, uh, they all increase dopamine and norepinephrine at the, at the terminal of the neuron when they, when they engage. Um, Methylphenidate does that a little bit more slowly. It's more of an upstream release. So it does not release as quickly or as intensely, um, although it tends to um, still be effective. Amphetamine is more of a direct release. The reason that matters is that looking at that mechanism of release, amphetamines do carry a bit of a higher addiction potential because of that immediate release. Um, rather than the slow release. And amphetamines have a little bit more data regarding irritability, which might re be related to that direct uh, effect, uh, agitating effect. Apart from that, in terms of efficacy for ADHD, they both are very similar and pretty highly efficacious. The other differences we're gonna talk about involve timing and release patterns, but I also wanna point out that you'll see new drugs entering the market that fall into stimulant categories all the time and they're getting more creative with how they package them. Medeus is one of the newer uh, amphetamine product. It actually has a three release system. So it releases immediate, intermediate, and long acting. Focalin or the dexamethylphenidate products are again the same active ingredients as the methylphenidate. But if you remember chemistry, you took chemistry, if you remember the L and R isomers, focalins like the active isomer of that combo where methylphenidate is both. Um, and then we also have medicines like prodrugs, like Vyvanse, where the medicine itself is not active. It has to be absorbed orally, be cleaved by the liver to release into an active product that um, is ultimately an amphetamine. And that type of biokinetic sort of packaging actually reduces the risk of diversion because you can't crush or snort Vyvanse because it requires going through the liver. So while you'll see more and more of these continue to come out and get creative with use, they really primarily fall in those two categories. So let's talk about what their indications are. Um, and then we're going to talk more in depth about how, how to think about them when you're taking them or writing them. So one of the things that it's clearly indicated for is ADHD, and most of these have both adult and pediatric indications, but interesting, not all of them have adult indications. Um, all of them have child uh, indications, and most are limited to age six and up. Um, sometimes you can have children that have hyperactivity from other causes. So if you have hyperactivity related to in utero exposure, or you have hyperactivity more linked to autism, these medicines may be helpful, but this is really where my caveat um, really is important to understand. If a child has more of a secondary reason for their ADHD, like it's part of a developmental delay of autism, or it's related to in utero exposure, the etiology of those conditions is quite different than biologically inherited ADHD. And without getting super detailed about it it, it, it involves the fact that if you've had an in utero substance insult or even a head injury, um, or if you, if even in autism, the, the reason for the ADHD symptoms is typically not a, a biologic or genetic a receptor transport problem. A lot of the genetic cases of ADHD, which are the most common cause passed from family to family member, 
those are more receptor issues with how dopamine is transported or how re is released. So when these medicines increase the amount of dopamine or norepinephrine, they're delivering more to the, the substrate area of that synapse and the receptors than, than you were able to do naturally. When you have a developmental delay or in utero exposure, your brain has actually been kind of damaged or the neurons may not all be there or the neurons may not be connecting correctly. And, and that is a population where stimulant medicines can work completely differently. Um, so while a little bit of stimulant may help a child with ADHD and autism or ADHD due to in utero exposure, if you add a lot of stimulant, those kids react completely differently because you get too much um, of the dopamine and norepinephrine in the synapse. So I, I hope that is, is makes a little bit of sense. I'm going to talk about how you might balance that out um, with treatment, but it's important to recognize that, that if, if it truly is not this biologically inherited ADHD, you, you may see far more side effects, especially at higher doses than you would if it's more of a genetically uh, passed on from generation to generation ADHD. Um, if when people that suffer traumatic brain injuries, um, especially frontal lobe injuries, there's often lots of executive functioning um, problems that come with that. Um, some low dose stimulants have, have been helpful for symptomatic treatment. Again, this, that is off label. And then in, in folks with severe depression, can't get out of bed, very low energy, um, low dose stimulants have been used as um, treatment for depression. It, again, that increase in norepinephrine and dopamine is sort of the same mechanism that something like bupropion, uh, which is an antidepressant, well, butrin may, may target. So those are some off-label indications where the primary indication is ADHD. And the other, the other reason stimulants are approved that go beyond the scope of this is it is primary treatment in narcolepsy um, as well, the sleep disorder. So of all the medicines and all the studies in my field of child analysis psychiatry, we know most about ADHD um, and most about stimulants in ADHD. And so, you know, parents never want their kids to be a guinea pig or try things that are untested or invalidated. And I can say without a doubt that understanding the role in treatment of ADHD with stimulants is one of the best studied Real, really fields of all children in medicine. There are more studies of stimulants and ADHD treatment than there are of antibiotics um, in, in children. So this is something we really have a lot of data on and understand probably better than most things. And generally speaking, especially in those kids with a biologically inherited um, non-secondary developmental reason, ADHD, the response rate is quite good. Um, about 70% is going to respond to the very first one we pick, about 90% will respond to the second one, and almost by the time you try your third one, 97% of kids can have good treatment results, um, and some of that is, is sometimes about um, symptom management, and, and, and while it's not been studied head-to-head, -head, there are some people that respond to both classes, methylphenidate and um, amphetamines, and there are some people that just respond better to one or the other, and I do think it is important to usually try three stimulants um, because you can still see success even if they reported side effects from the other. I often pick a different class or a different release pattern when I make those changes. The thing about stimulants and really all scheduled to FDA medications, to be honest, is to really understand the timing of these medicines. Unlike a lot of medicines in psychiatry, these are not 24-hour medications. Parents need to, to understand that if they are given, a child is given a medicine in the morning, they go off to school, that medicine may be completely gone by the time they got home. They are not designed to act, lack 24 hours. And if you miss the medicine the next day, all the symptoms come back. These are time release medicines. And half of what I spend talking about in follow up is understanding the timing. The timing of when a side effect occurs. What did it occur when the medicine started? Did it occur when the medicine wore off? And also the timing of the ADHD symptoms. I gave this medicine, it took an hour to kick in. They seemed to do a lot better with their hyperactivity and focus, but then by this time of day, everything was back or worse from what it was. To understand the timing is critical and the timing has to be quite uh, tweaked um, as well. But if you look at someone's medicine, you have to look at the timing they're given and how, how long they're reporting um, success, especially when you compare it to behavioral challenges that might be occurring. 
And so they, they do tend to come in three categories. There's sort of the short acting or immediate release group. Those short acting immediately release products only last about four to six hours. Um, there are some kids because they metabolize them really fast that may only report two or three hours of, of efficacy. And then the long acting or extended release grouping, there's an intermediate group that's more eight to 10 hours and a long acting, that's still only about 12 hours. Of, of true efficacy. And, and the long acting group is felt to really be critical for um, getting a kid through a school day. Um, but, but often, especially if kids are working into the evening or their ADHD symptoms may impact more than just school, especially if their social life is, is also impaired by, by focus and concentration deficits, they may need coverage more 24 hours or more throughout the evening. And there are options to support that. Um, so again, here are the categories. Um, they all work to some degree, again, in this class to increase dopamine and norepinephrine. And it's really important that, that there's some understanding regarding uh, dosage. Now, I will, I will tell you, this is not a hard and fast rule. And if you get one of those fancily packaged release <laughs> medications, um, you, you have to also know how the medicine releases. But for the short acting form as a basic rule, about 10 milligrams of a methylphenidate product or Ritalin product equals about five milligrams of Adderall amphetamine product. So if you are seeing a kid and suddenly their insurance stops paying for one and you have to switch to another one, you want to be thoughtful about some degree of dose equivalency. There are some online dose calendar uh, calculators and conversions. A lot of times insurance companies will put out bulletins when they switch their formulary with the conversion calculator. But if you're switching between stimulants, especially because of an insurance change, you do want to try to get as close as you can to the efficacious dose that worked before. Because if you go back and start from the bottom or the lowest dose again, they, they may not have success. So it's important to kind of be aware of that. Um, it's also important to know the exceptions. Something like Focalin, which is not methylphenidate, but dexmethylphenidate is only about half the dose of the original methylphenidate or Ritalin, which equals amphetamine dosing. And some medicines like Vyvanse that are a pro-drug do not obey those dosing rules at all. Um, so I, I, I get in, in my head a little bit about how you do that. The other thing to understand about um, the, the medicines is especially these ones that have XR or SR after them, that's gonna indicate, and if you get nerdy with it, you can look at the package labeling. Those medicines typically have an immediate release component and a long acting component as part of them. I'm gonna take Concerta, um, which is an example now. Concerta is a very unusual release medicine. It requires an osmotic pump. It has to go across the, um, the um, go through the gut. So it's pumped, the medicine is pumped out through an osmotic like gradient out of the pill. But if you look at the dose of Concerta, let's say you take 18 milligrams. The way that medicine gets released is about four milligrams comes out immediately or 22%. And then the rest of it, 14 milligrams of that 18 milligrams dose, 78% of it, it comes out long-term. So if someone comes in and they're on Concerta and they tell you this medicine works beautifully all afternoon, it's the best medicine I ever had, but they tell you the morning was really hard and it seemed like it took uh, three hours for it to kick in, you have to understand that that medicine released four milligrams and then 14 milligrams, that child got much bigger dose in the afternoon. So this child may need more consistency or higher dose in the morning in terms of the release. Other products like the Metadate CD, if you look on it, you'll see 30 slash 40, I'm uh, sorry, 30 slash 70. If you see that slash, that first number, that 30%, that means 30% of that dose is released immediately and then 70% is released later. Some of them will say 50-50. So um, it is sometimes helpful to understand how the medicine's being released. Something like Journey, which is a brand new one, has a real interesting release pattern. It actually is given at bedtime. It's the only one specifically at bedtime. It's coated like in lots of layers that get dissolved in the stomach. So if you take it at night, it sits in the stomach all night, dissolves the layers, the idea is it starts releasing before the child wakes up and its sort of area is to cover these really intensive morning symptoms 
that, that are often difficult and challenging for families before a regular medicine would kick in. So these are all sort of the subtle differences that they have um, between them. And then medicines like Medias, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right. It actually is felt to cover the longest of all of them. It has a short acting component, one that covers the midday, and then it has another layer that's released to kind of cover an after school dose. Um, and it was sort of designed to be capturing the kids that take a long acting during the school day, and then we're taking a short acting to get through homework in the evening. It was designed to do that. So you can see how they all um, are sort of designed a little bit to, to, to figure out how to cover the symptoms as long as the child needs them. And then all of them come in lots of different forms. They can be liquid, they can be patches. Some pills you can open up and sprinkle and dissolves. Um, some are chewable. So there's so many different formulations that often you can find a product that, that even younger children may be able to handle. Um, before I go into sort of some side effects and common things to know about, is there any questions? I'm sorry, I cannot see the chat. Um, right now, are there any questions that anybody is having about stimulants? I'll keep an eye out for the chat for you, Dr. Swagger. Where would like Intunit and that class, will you get to that yes. or? That's a whole separate class. We're gonna do that one right after this. So we will get there, yes. And I, I will say before we get there, traditionally stimulants, treat all three of those symptoms well of ADHD. They, they have good efficacy for hyperactivity, impulse control, and focus. And that's gonna be really important when we get to that in tune class, okay? Okay, uh, quickly, just things to be aware of with stimulants is there are side effects that are very specific to stimulant medicines. Of course, one of the things that's, I think most concerning to prescribers because it is a controlled substance. It has great efficacy and data for ADHD, but it's challenging for providers often because of the regulation and fears of prescribing controlled substances, especially in the day and age where we've had so much substance use. Um, and so there are um, cautionary things that need to be understood regarding divergent and dependency. But one of the things I wanna say, and this probably warrants even more discussion, but untreated ADHD um, actually has a much higher likelihood of having substance use disorder than treated ADHD, especially before pu puberty. So if you are seeing young children and they truly have ADHD, you know, it's really helpful that parents understand that treating that ADHD, even with a stimulant, that may sound like it's an abused controlled medicine, that actually reduces their chance of turning to substances later on. And that's a very well-known thing. And people that are not misusing ADHD medicine, there's no risk specifically in treated ADHD of conversion to substance use from appropriate dosing. Um, but, but people are afraid of these medicines. And so if a child has an active substance use disorder themselves, this may not be the best choice, not because it will specifically um, be something that will cause them to have problems, but it, it is giving them something they could trade or sell. And so it's important that kids be kind of educated that, that they can't give the medicine, it needs locked up, it still needs picked up in certain ways, they can't do early fills. So there's some monitoring, but from a treatment standpoint, um, it does not increase necessarily someone's own substance use disorder if they have comorbidities, but there may be better choices. It's even if there's an active member of the family, maybe not the child, but an active member of the family with substance use, choosing something other than a stimulant may, again, reduce the, the chance that it could get diverted. The most common side effects from these medicines are GI. These medicines do suppress appetite, so monitoring kids' growth is really important. Often that growth um, changes in weight and height is, is pretty mild and often recovers pretty quickly, but it can be pretty, you know, parents can kind of watch and monitor how their kids are eating. Sometimes they get really worried that the kid's not eating enough. Lots of times the kids will catch up and it's not a major issue, but it, they do need their growth tracked. And there are things to do to adjust it if growth becomes a concern. It's also important that as a child gets larger and bigger, their dose that they're on may not continue to help them and they may need a dose adjustment. 
um, or sometimes the doses poop out um, because they've just been hitting the receptors so much that they may not be working the way they should. And so we, we always have to monitor height, weight, growth. Um, if taken too close to the bedtime, sometimes these, these medicines can worsen sleep, they can cause headaches. Um, at one point, some of the labeling said that stimulants worsen ticks, the motor ticks. Um, but there's been a lot of studies that have disproven this. Um, in fact, there's quite the comorbidity between ADHD and ticks and long-term stimulant use does not seem to worsen it, but sometimes it can, it can occur at the same time um, and, and needs to be followed. And then, you know, there, there have been reports of um, psychotic features or mania coming from stimulants. Usually this is a result of diversion or too high of dose. Um, it is incredibly rare. And usually people have other risk factors for those things, but they are possible things that need monitoring. Dr. Slager, I hate to interrupt. We had a question in the chat I wanted to maybe address yeah. while we're on that slide. Um, they were asking, uh, what if the parents have history of SUD? Do you drug test the child? And what do you do if they are negative? Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, there is not specific guidelines for drug testing children regarding um, sort of compliance. Um, you can drug test a child if you suspect they have their own drug use, but there's lots of reasons why it cannot be helpful to monitoring compliance per se. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It, rare, it, it only hangs around in the system for about 48 hours. So you could have a child that just ran out of their medicine that's gonna be negative and, and you're, you're gonna feel a false sense or, or get a false report. The other problem is methylphenidate does not show up at all in the standard urine drug screen, only amphetamine does. And I have to tell you, I have seen providers order drug screens. They say, oh, you don't have any stimulants in. The kid was on Ritalin. It's not going to show up anyway. And assumptions were made that the kid wasn't taking the medicine the parents were lying that were not accurate because of the sophistication of the drug test. I would never order a drug screen without doing proper screening of, of the child first. And you have much more success about asking than, than random drug screens. Kids, however, with with actual um, substance use problems, there is an evidence base for randomized drug screening for them, but it's more about um, looking for uh, illicit substance use specifically than, than if they are taking or not taking that. It's a, it's a good question. Do I drug test the parents? No. Um, I will report parents to CPS if I suspect there's diversion. You can check board of pharmacies or, or questions. But um, if, if I know if I'm engaged in collaborative care and I know the parent is in their own treatment, I can reach out to the parent's provider with their permission and voice a concern. But um, it's very you can't really you'd have to bill the parent's insurance or they'd be responsible for the test. Um, and that has the same challenges about when you take the prescription, if they could have taken it two weeks ago, you're not going to find anything. So there's a lot of issues with drug screening. Um, if you suspect and, and the drug screen you're choosing can look for it, it can be helpful. Um, but as a routine everyday sort of thing without that individual choice and timing choice, it's a, it's a, harder, it's a harder tool, if that helps. Um, this, this was a big thing in like 2004 when uh, Canada pulled Adderall from their shelves and there had been some reports of sudden death warnings. And, and so um, this got into the labeling and of course terrified everyone. Um, ultimately, the reaction was sort of like, oh, you need to do a cardiac screenings on everyone uh, and get EKGs. That was, that was felt to probably be a little bit too severe, but they do encourage people to screen for cardiovascular symptoms because of that mild increase in blood pressure and pulse that could happen. Usually in therapeutic doses, the increase is not more than a couple of points and unlikely to cause problems. But if the child has an underlying cardiac condition, arrhythmia, um, hypertrophic heart, where you might have outflow issues, that increase could be a concern. And most of the cases when they investigate a sudden, sudden death um, issue, 
uh, was actually related to kids that had sort of congenital problems and secondary causes. So I always ask about cardiac history. Uh, it's part of the monitoring for tach tachycardia and blood pressure and pulse that you can do regularly. Um, the other really, there are two other really important questions to ask. I ask kids if when they're running around, do they get chest pain or short of breath? Um, you have to remember a lot of these kids are super hyper. They're doing their own stress test every day. And if they're running all over your office, climbing your bookcase from their ADHD, if they're not getting symptomatic, it's pretty unlikely that the medicine will actually increase the blood pressure and pulse more than the running around. In fact, there's a lot of kids that have a lot of chronic heart conditions that are have high comorbidity with ADHD. And a lot of the cardiac surgeons will sometimes prefer we still use stimulants in those kids. And they have said to me when I've asked, you know, that kid running around prevents their healing and recovery. I, that the ADHD medicines are actually calming them down so that they can recover. It's not having a, a, a huge impact on their cardiac function. And sometimes they're telling me they're actually calming down. So those those numbers aren't as high. So it's a it's a it's a complicated thing. Um, if there's ever any concern, I, I always ask the pediatrician. I ask um, for a cardiac uh, question. Good relationship with WU cardiologists over the years to say, do you have any concerns about using stimulants in these kids? And, and they often will give a very direct answer. I will also say that some of the other medicines also have cardiac warning. So even though this is the one that has that sudden death warning, there are other blood pressure and cardiac issues with the other non-stimulant medications that can't be forgotten either. But this is of course something um, that's important. The other question I ask is if there's a family history of any cardiac problems, unexplained sudden death and unexplained drowning. Those often indicate that there's a congenital or cardiac um, issue in the family that might really warrant an EKG. And finally, if you if you have concerns, you li I listen to their heart and see if the rate's normal, in addition to the vital signs, and I ask them to Valsalva and see if I truly hear an abnormal rhythm it can actually all be really important parts. Now, a lot of times they're doing these same screenings and sports physicals now for kids too. So making sure that they've had their updated annual exam can, can also be very helpful. And there's again, an excellent parent medication guide on this website um, that I, I goes through a lot of the, well, how do I choose? What's the different stuff that we're talking about today that's just really well-written for parents to, to look at. All right, so this is the, the class of medicines that you were asking about. These are called the alpha-2 agonists. They also work um, on norepinephrine, but they work in a completely different way. Both of these are actually blood pressure medications. And instead of increasing norepinephrine and dopamine in the frontal lobe, in the cortex, they actually work peripherally on their adrenergic system. So they're kind of blocking norepinephrine outflow um, in reverse at the periphery through the adrenal glands. And so with that knowledge, because they're acting more peripherally than centrally on the brain, these medicines as a group are much better at treating hyperactivity and impulse control than focus. Now, in some of the self-report measures, there have been reports that these medicines increase focus, but those are often the indication that they're sitting still to focus. There have not been any like true neurological or neuropsych testing reports that show these types of medicines directly increase attention and focus, um, although they, they may be helpful. I think that's really important to, to understand because if you have somebody with inattentive ADHD, not the hyperactive version, or these medicines may have pretty limited utility for focus. So it's not recommended that this class of medicines be started for inattentive only symptoms, unless you're using them from, uh, for other reasons, okay? Um, these medicines can be used on their own to treat combination or hyperactive impulsive ADHD type. They can also, part of their labeling, and this is FDA approved, is to be combined with the stimulants. And so you can combine an alpha agonist with the stimulant. And often that means a lower dose of each that can be really helpful sometimes if you get side effects um, from either class alone. Sometimes the combination can, can be helpful for kids. These medicines come in short acting and long acting forms. CAPVE is the long acting form of clonidine. It's taken twice a day. 
and guanfacine, which is normally twice a day. It has intuna, which is taken once a day. So they can be used for ADHD, but because these medicines are acting peripherally on that adrenergic system, they have off-label, these are all off-label indications for other things. And so they have some efficacy status in, in helping with hyperarousal rate, you're blocking that adrenal, that fright flight response that happens in trauma. So they may help some kids that have comorbid hyperarousal. They can suppress REM sleep, specifically clonidine. So they can help with nightmares and flashbacks. Clonidine is very sedating. Um, it's That's one of its biggest side effects. And sometimes people use that side effect just to treat sleep. So the kids that are wildly hyper because all their stimulants gone and they are so hyper, they can't even settle down to go to sleep. Clonidine at night might treat that hyperactivity and be a little bit sedating that it can help with the, the bedtime ADHD symptoms. There also have been, again, because it's pre peripheral acting sort of events, sometimes these medicines are again used off-label just for impulsive aggression, um, especially kids that have a lot of developmental issues. Remember I told you, like if you have neuronal involvement, if you have autism with neuronal changes or you had a in utero exposure and you don't have as many neurons in your brain where those other medicines act, these medicines act peripherally. So these medicines don't have as much impact on the cortex. They can be a really helpful alternative for some kids with aggression um, that can't handle um, stimulants. And then there's some question because of that fight flight suppression, could these medicines again be used off-label to help some people with anxiety? Again, off-label, but some people do report um, helping, especially with that hypervigilant type feeling. The biggest, there are two limiting reactions to this medicine. The number one is sedation. These medicines can be sedating if you can get to a dose where the kids start sleeping instead of staying awake, especially if you're using it for daytime control. So if I find out a kid is sleeping through school, that's too much medication. Um, and that is, is very common. They also, this, these medicines are also blood pressure medicines. They act peripherally and you can see a decrease in blood pressure um, from them. Rarely do you see the blood pressure dropping, but you will get kids that say they feel dizzy or lightheaded, and that may be a result of the medicine. And then long-term use is questionable if it can contribute to depression or irritability. Um, and so, as I said, you can use these medicines in combination with stimulants um, to sort of, especially if you have like a kid who can't tolerate too much stimulant because they're suppressing their appetite, but they have a lot of hyperactivity, you might be able to use a lower dose stimulant to treat some of the attentional pieces and then the alpha agonist to sort of add to the effect on, on hyperactivity. I hope that answered your question a little bit about the intuitive. Does, that, does this part make sense for the alpha two agonist? All right, so then we're gonna move into the third kind of class of ADHD medicine. These are, are often the non-stimulant ADHD medicine, and there are two on the market right now that carry FDA approval. One is Atomoxetine or Stratera, and the other one is, is, is very much newer. It's only been out maybe a little over a year, two years. I have no idea how to pronounce the brand name. I think it's Veloxine. Um, but it goes by Quelbri um, that are on the market. And these medicines are selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So these have very different mechanism of action. Those medicines we talked about before are very, very timing specific. These medicines are, are more of a start it and build up efficacy over time sort of effect. And they work by upregulating the release of neuro, uh, norepinephrine at the receptors. And they are both 24 hour medications. So Stratera or Amoxetine was the first non-stimulant approved for ADHD. For years, it was the only one. Um, it does increase norepinephrine and a little bit of dopamine in that prefrontal cortex, which again, cortical, cortical action right there in that prefrontal cortex means that this will treat all three symptoms of ADHD as well. This will help with concentration and focus. This will help with hyperactivity and impulse control. So it will, it will, it will be helpful for all three symptoms. Um, there are some studies, it does not have that labeling, but there are some studies that this might be a good choice in someone with ADHD and maybe a little bit of anxiety or depressive symptoms. Again, that has not been 
as well studied. And I will say that treating ADHD really helps anxiety. A lot of people um, that have untreated ADHD get very anxious. They are missing things. And you'll often sometimes see like almost OCD correction symptoms to correct for attention that can be very anxiety provoking. So treating ADHD by itself has also been shown to help anxiety, but because of the mechanism of action of this medicine being a little bit like antidepressants, sometimes it, it is thought to maybe be an option um, as a single agent for both. Um, the other, other sort of challenge is that depending on what studies you look at, um, when atomoxetine has been sort of studied head to head with stimulants, some studies have showed equal efficacy, but in other studies, that's not been the case. And so in some larger reviews, there's been a question if, if stratera might have a lower efficacy than stimulants, and that's been, been questioned. Um, I would say that I think this sometimes is very dependent on the person, how they metabolize things, and, and how the dose has, has uh, happened. It's really important to understand these medicines do not work immediately. If you give a stimulant or you give an alpha agonist, people will sometimes report improvement in one or two days. You're going to need a couple of weeks to get to the right dose with this type of medicine. And this is a very weight-based medication. You have to, st this is one of the very few that are truly weight-based in psychiatry. And if you do not dose it correctly for a person's weight, it will not work. So you start it around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and you need to increase it over about a week or two to around one point, about one to 1.4. Some studies have taken it up to 1.8. Um, the labeling's 1.4. If you don't get it to the, the right dose, it, it really won't work. And so I've seen a lot of failures because the dose wasn't increased effectively. Um, the, the nice, really nice thing about this is these medicines don't have the on-off effect of some of the stimulants or alpha agonists, and they really can provide 24-7 symptom coverage for people um, if, they, if they work. Um, the other thing I will mention on the other side, this medicine goes through 2D6 um, in the liver, which is one of the enzymes that about 10% of the population doesn't process well, so you can get um, side effects from this medicine. Um, Stratera has some side effects to be aware of. The most common is GI upset, which is common with all of the antidepressants. It does take longer to work. There were some reports of liver toxicity in two cases that got submitted to the FDA. So they do have these liver warnings on them, but it was incredibly rare, not well understood. Um, it didn't happen in enough cases that they recommended doing liver monitoring, but that's something people will ask about. The one thing that often scares people from Stratera and Quelbri is that because it works like an antidepressant, it does not have any labeling indication for depression or anxiety. Because it works like that, both of these medicines carry the black box for suicidality that all um, mood and, and depressive uh, medicines do. Um, and it is just because of the mechanism of action. Um, again, this is something to monitor. Um, it's really not been shown that if you're using it for ADHD, you'll suddenly see an increase in suicidality, but it is important to always screen kids for that. In fact, um, if you guys have heard me probably say this before, ADHD as a diagnosis and impulse control problems has a higher risk for suicidality in kids even than depression. So it's important to monitor, but it can be a complicated thing with the, with the medicine, but, but something that parents will, will be concerned about. Some kids will have behavioral changes. Um, from the medication. I think a lot of that may be related to processing in that 2D6 part um, to be aware of. Again, you should see that happening sort of time-wise. But the other thing is because it's an antidepressant, you're increasing norepinephrine, maybe a little bit of serotonin dopamine, so you can get a restlessness or akathisia, especially in young kids that can look like worsening hyperactivity to be aware of that can make the behavior look worse. And that usually happens early on. As a general rule, this medicine does not worsen ticks. And it has less effects on blood pressure and pulse than stimulants. Now, there are some reports um, of it affecting some arrhythmias, especially if there's a 2D6 sort of problem with how it processes and interacts with substances. So I have had some, some kids actually with cardiology who have actually asked me to avoid Stratera um, because the child had an arrhythmia. Um, but but it usually is less of a problem on blood pressure and pulse than the other class. Hope that makes sense. Um, the new one, Colbri, um, also similar in how it works, 
also has 24 hour coverage, still has that black box warning because the mechanism of action. And, um, and uh, the good news is it can be opened and sprinkled. Stratera, you had to swallow whole. And there were lots and lots of kids, especially young ones that just could never take Stratera because they couldn't swallow pills. And this new formula can be sprinkled. So it really has, has been a good option for some kids. It also has a taper up schedule. So it takes a little bit of time to kick in and work. It's approved for adults as well. And, and this medicine acts through different metabolic pathways. It's less 2D6, more CYP1A2, which is the benzo uh, pathway. So you really shouldn't probably mix this medicine with benzodiazepines um, anyway, but um, a little bit of a different uh, process, process and metabolism pathway that can be a game changer for people just because they have side effects from one doesn't mean they'll have side effects necessarily from this one. That was very quick, all the FDA approved ones specifically. This list right here, we're gonna end with, I just want you to know there is data, but there's not a lot of great data and all of these are off label. So these would be your fourth, fifth, sixth line medication options. Um, they do have some data, but they are not FDA approved and there, there may be different reasons. I mentioned bupropion that increases norepinephrine and um, dopamine goes by well, butrin, also Zyban for smoking cessation. It has maybe some indication in substance using populations, especially adults, that you might not want to get a stimulant to. Um, but its efficacy is not as well established, but it, it, it has helped with some of the craving pathways in substance use. So it may be a good option, maybe more for adults. Um, if you have a child that's depressed, um, especially with a lot of low energy concentration symptoms, that might also be a choice, but again, off-label. Tricyclic antidepressants um, actually have some good efficacy with treating ADHD um, because the tricyclic antidepressants are that SNRI action, but for other reasons, there's a lot of cardiac toxicity, especially if you have too high of doses. Um, there's an overdose risk with tricyclics, but they could be an option sometimes in kids that have bedwetting problems. And mipramine might be an agent that can help bedwetting and a little bit of ADHD. But again, these are way down usually in treatment algorithms. Modafinil, which is approved for narcolepsy, actually had some really good effective studies for ADHD in early trials. But um, when it was going through the process to, to be considered for ADHD, the risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome was emerged and the company didn't really want to spend the money to, to investigate it more. But there were some data um, uh, again, modafinil is, is also regulated by the FDA um, and monitored in, in drug uh, enforcement circles, so it's a little harder to use, but it does have some data, certainly in people that might have code morbid narcolepsy, that could also be a choice. And there are some cases of amantadine, which is used for the flu and Parkinsonism. It has some mild dopaminergic activity that has helped hyperactivity, especially in the cases um, with developmental delay or autism. All right, and then the final thing, and I, she will send this out to you all. So um, I just love this chart and we will send this out in the email. This is, um, this is a, whoop, sorry, just shut this. This is a fancy little chart that has on one side all the methylphenidate stimulants. And then on the back side, it has the non-stimulants. They haven't added Quilbury yet to it because the newest one I could find was 2019, but it has, all the different stimulant medicines. It tells you what dose it came in. It shows you what forms it comes in. It talks about how the split release is happening. And, and you can see if it's short or long acting. And sometimes parents like only know the color or the kid only knows the color of the pill. And so if you really wanna ask a kid if they've been taking their medicine, uh, pull out if it's brand, you can you can pull it out and say, is this, you would tell, show me which one you take. I take this one every day. And that sometimes can, can also be really helpful to identifying a medicine or asking the kid to identify it if you're worried about diversion. Um, but this is a great chart um, that can kind of um, help you gauge what, what options, especially liquid, and if you can open them that I just really like. So I want you all to have that and she will send that out. And I am I've got five minutes to spare. So any questions? Whoop, how do I get the share off? I can do that on my end for you if you'd like. Yeah, I think I found oh, it. There you go. Thank All you right. so much, Dr. Swagger. That was awesome. I'm, I'm really happy you're able to do the part two of that. And um, like you mentioned um, to everyone, I'll be attaching um, the PDF as well into the recap email. 
Any questions, comments? Was this helpful for the folks on here that are doing prescribing? Um, and I know we have a lot of non-prescribers on there. Your information about timing and what you see can also be incredibly helpful. I've had a lot of therapists tell me, I can't, they have their therapy appointment after school and they're so hyper they can't do therapy because um, their medicine wore off. So I, I think we're all part of, of, of monitoring this and, and getting information too, so. Got a thumbs up emoji from Jerry <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> I love the reactions that you can do on here. Uh, we got a chat saying this has been very helpful as a prescriber. Thank you, Brandy, for commenting and feel free to chat in or uh, unmute as well if you have more to elaborate. Thank you. Any other comments? Great job as usual. Amanda chatted that in. <laughs> And if anyone ever has questions, you can always reach out to us via email as well. And we'll make sure to have the questions addressed. Loving uh, Matthew, your dog picture. It's really cute. I can't stop looking at it. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah says thanks. Great information. All right. Well, Dr. Swagger, I think you did an awesome job. Everyone's just thanking you. So that's wonderful. And happy I think February, everybody. We survived yeah. February. Woo! Oh my gosh, yes. And February is a short month. So by the time we know it's going to be spring, we're going to be wearing short sleeves and we're going to be sweating. So enjoy the chilly weather while it's here. But I can't wait personally for spring. All righty. Well, if that's all, thank you again, Dr. Swagger. You always do a wonderful job. I'll just reiterate what everyone's saying in the chat over there. Uh, my only announcement that the, is that the next session will be on February 15th, and Dr. Lillard will be presenting on parental fitness evaluation. So keep an eye out for that reminder. Thank you all so, so much. As always, it's great to have you all on, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.